Okay, so we were talking about, uh, yesterday we talked about memory organization and technology, and we discussed SRAM, and all memory looks the same, we talked about that, but there are some differences. SRAM is usually on chip. Uh, as a result, you normally supply, uh, you, you, you see that there is M plus M over here, uh, this is the address bits, and N bits specify the row address, and M bits specify the column address within a row. And we discussed how you actually read data from here, uh, you can refer to the yesterday's lecture for that. But one difference between SRAM and DRAM, as I draw it over here, is you see that you supply not M plus M bits to DRAM, this is SRAM, you supply N plus M bits, but to DRAM you first supply N bits, and that gets latched into this row address register, or row address strobe, uh, that's also essentially the row address. And then uh, the row gets activated, and while that's happening, you supply the column address bits, column address strobe, the bottom M bits of the address, if you will, and that it gets latched into this column address strobe latch or register, and that uh, is used to max out the appropriate column from the row that is activated. So why is it done this way? Why don't we supply all of the bits, N plus M, to uh, the DRAM chip? Well, that's because DRAM chip is a separate chip. Separate chip, chip means that it needs separate pins. Separate pins means that pins, pins cost, and if you supply a lot of data, you need a lot of pins. And you don't really need to supply the row address and the column address at the same time, right? Because you first need to activate the row, which takes time, and after that, uh, you need to uh, you need to max out the column that you need. Which means that you can first supply the row address to start the activation, and while the activation is going on, you can supply the column address. That makes sense hopefully, right? That's the reason uh, we don't need to supply the whole N plus M bits into the DRAM chip at the same time to minimize cost. Whereas we don't have that restriction in SRAM usually, because SRAM is on the same chip as the processor, you don't need to go off chip to access the SRAM uh, memory. As a result, you don't have as much restriction on the number of wires you, uh, uh, you, you, you can have. In this case, you, you need to have M plus M, M wires, as you can see over here, and N of them goes here, and M of M goes here. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. So that's one of the examples of restrictions of technology that you have. In fact, the data outputs of DRAM chips are also smaller because of that, whereas SRAM data outputs can be much larger because they're on the same chip as the processor. Why are they on different chips? I guess you could ask that question also, and that answer is actually somewhere on this picture, and this answer is over here, basically. DRAM, manufacturing a DRAM chip requires putting the capacitor and the logic together, and capacitor, uh, manufacturing the capacitor is a totally different process than manufacturing the logic, and DRAM chips are actually optimized for manufacturing these capacitors, uh, so that you can get very high density, because capacitor is the bigger structure that you have. If you can minimize the size of the capacitor, then you can actually have a much denser chip. So this DRAM chip is optimized for capacitor, whereas the processor chip is optimized for logic. And that's a very different process. As a result, it doesn't go well when you actually try to manufacture DRAM and logic on the same chip. Uh, what you get is very leaky or slow logic, because the process technology is not good for manufacturing logic. To be able to really understand this, you need to really un uh, understand the manufacturing technology itself. Uh, but if you're interested, you can do some reading on it. Okay, so basically we covered DRAM and SRAM as two major technologies. Uh, you can see that the red parts are the negatives of DRAM, the green parts are the positive, and as I said yesterday, we're, we're taking uh, all the negatives because these positives are really important. You get high density, as a result, you get very high capacity chips uh, and at low cost. On the other hand, SRAM is faster access, there's no capacitor. Capacitor itself, that sensing process of the capacitor act is actually a slow process. Uh, as a result, by eliminating the capacitor, you don't have that slow process, so you have faster access. No need for refresh, again, because you don't have the capacitor. And manufacturing is, is compatible with the pro logic process, again, because you don't have the capacitor in SRAM. This is purely logic-based, transistor-based memory. Uh, but as a result of this, you get lower density and higher cost.
So we have a clear trade-off between different memory technologies. And as a result, we have memory hierarchies that are built up. And this is one example of a memory hierarchy, as you can see. This doesn't even show some of the caches, but we have, uh, this is AMD Barcelona. Uh, it's a chip uh, that was modern as of 2006 or so. But a lot of the chips look like this today. You have a bunch of cores, you have caches, uh, you have some other caches that are shared. And inside the cores, you have actually L1 caches. So this picture is instructive because I don't put the L1 caches separately. L1 cache is really usually considered as part of the core. Uh, more outer level caches are not considered as part of the core in general. So as you go outer and outer, farther away from the core, the caches can be more, the design of the caches can be more relaxed from the constraints of the design of the core. And we will make this clear in a little bit because uh, the caches that you have in the core need to supply data very quickly into the pipeline, ideally in one cycle, so that the pipeline doesn't need to stall, right? Whereas these other caches are there to feed the L1 cache as much as possible. They're not there to directly supply data into the pipeline. Okay, but this is a hierarchy, as you can see. There's L1 over here. Well, there are registers over here, L2, uh, L3, uh, and then the DRAM interface, and then the DRAM banks. Okay, so ideal memory. We talked about this yesterday. We want everything ideal, ideally, uh, which means that we want zero access time as much as possible, infinite capacity, zero cost, and infinite bandwidth, so that, such that we can support multiple accesses in parallel. And we saw some methods of getting close to infinite bandwidth, right, by banking, right, so that we can get some, some level of throughput that we want, or multi-porting, having multiple ports to the same bank that enabled us to do multiple accesses in the same cycle. All of those enabled uh, us to have higher bandwidth than a single monolithic array could support. And we discussed this yesterday, and we discussed this a lot when we talked about Cray-1. Now we're going to look at uh, trade-offs somewhere over here. Basically, the problem is, if you want ideal memory like this, these requirements oppose each other. Right. Let's take a look at them. If you want bigger memory, that's slower, for the reasons we've discussed, right? You need a large row decoder, you need a longer row, and you need longer bit lines. Uh, and that makes everything slower. And faster is also more expensive at the same time. So it's hard to get zero cost, infinite capacity, and zero latency at the same time. And higher bandwidth is also more expensive. All banking, multi-porting, uh, replicating the different memories, uh, that leads to a, high, a higher cost. So bigger, we said that it takes longer to determine the location. Clearly, that's a problem, uh, and that makes it slow. Faster depends on the memory technology. SRAM versus DRAM versus disk versus tape. As you go from left to right over here, you become slower, and you become less expensive. So slow is less expensive in terms of technology. But as you, if you want to be faster, you need to pay the money for it and pay the cost for it. And higher bandwidth is more expensive. To support higher bandwidth, you need more banks, more ports, or higher frequency to access memory, or some faster technology uh, that can provide you more data uh, per second, right? And that all costs money. So this is one example. This is actually relatively old data over here. Uh, I think sample values sampled around 2011, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the numbers don't matter necessarily, but the, mag the differences matter over here. So if you look over here, a small SRAM is sub-nanosecond access latency. A larger SRAM takes about nanosecond or nanoseconds access latency. DRAM takes 50 nanoseconds or so. Hard disk takes about 10 milliseconds or so. So it's clear. But then the, your capacity is also increasing over here. And even within the same technology, if you increase the size, your, your, uh, your uh, access time increases. So hopefully that's obvious. If you look at the technologies over here in terms of price, SRAM is less than $10 per megabyte, again, circa 2011. You can do the study on your own also today. DRAM is actually, all of these costs are reducing. This is the technology scaling and, uh, and Moore's law, right? DRAM is less than $1 per megabyte. Hard disk is less than $1 per gigabyte. And if you looked, at, looked back in 1960s, the numbers would be much different, but they would, they would be proportionally similar. Okay, so other technologies also have their place as well. Flash memory is a very mature technology, which is really fascinating, actually, how it works. We just don't have time to talk about it. And in a sense, flash memory is very, very interesting because it is, it is a technology that has really enabled a lot of devices. For example, I, I believe I have this device today because flash memory technology was mature enough 
uh, for me to be able to store, I don't know, 128 gigabytes in this form factor, right? I don't want to carry a hard disk in this thing, right? But flash memory, a solid state drive technology enabled this device and other devices that look like this. Right? There are other technologies that are also uh, coming up, phase change memory, uh, magnetic memory, uh, resistor memory, uh, memristors. They're also very, very interesting, but we don't really have time to talk about these. All of these are non-volatile technologies like the hard disk. Basically, when you turn the power off, they don't lose data. Whereas SRAM and DRAM, they're volatile technologies. When you turn the power off, they lose data. Right? Uh, and these non-volatile technologies are non-volatile because of the nature of... Uh, mm, of the materials uh, that, that make up uh, the storage device. Right? Uh, but of course, these technologies are usually slower, although some of these technologies are getting close to the latencies of DRAM, which means that it may be possible to have large non-volatile memory that's very similar to DRAM in terms of its characteristics. Now, if that happens, then it may be very interesting, right? Okay, that's, all, that's where I leave this over here. Okay, my point is, why do we want, uh, what, what is the purpose of the slide? Bigger is slower, faster is more expensive. But we want both fast and large. We're greedy, right? We want to get the best of all worlds. The problem is we cannot achieve both with a single level of memory. Hopefully that's clear. Uh, and the idea of a memory hierarchy is very simple. If you cannot achieve both with a single level of memory, why don't you have multiple levels of memory or storage, which get progressively bigger and slower and maybe turn into different technologies as the levels become farther from the processor or pipeline. And if we ensure that most of the data that the processor needs is kept in the fastest and the smallest level, then we hopefully win. Because most of the time when we access the data, the data is in the first level that's really fast. It may be small, but that's okay. As long as we find the data over there, that's good. Sometimes the data is not there, so we need to go to the next level. It takes slower, but maybe that's okay. And even less frequently, the data is not in the next level, and we need to go to memory, let's say. That takes even slower, but as long as we don't do it very often, maybe we get a good performance trade-off, right? Performance cost trade-off. That's the idea of a memory hierarchy, essentially. And this is one example. Basically, you have fast, but small, big, or large but slow, uh, and uh, you, ideally, uh, you want to access, uh, get, get your data uh, request to be satisfied from here. Assume that processor is sitting somewhere over here. Uh, so you want to move what you use or what you need over here, and you want to back up what you don't use in this big but slow memory. And if you have good locality of reference, which we will talk about, uh, this memory, that is hierarchical appears as fast and as large as this one over here. As fast as this one and as large as this one. That's the idea, basically. You want to give the illusion that your memory is as fast as a small memory, but as large as this large memory. And clearly, there's nothing that prevents us from putting more levels over here. Uh, you can progressively do things like this. And these could become different technologies. This could be SRAM, for example. This could be DRAM. And maybe there's some, other, uh, some room for some other technology over here. But in today's world, it's more like more of, most of these are SRAM. There's also an embedded DRAM technology, which we didn't talk about, which is a DRAM technology that's relatively compatible with logic, but it's much, much more costly than DRAM. It's a little bit less costly than SRAM. So it fits uh, somewhere over here. It's used in some big processors, like IBM's processors use large embedded DRAM caches. So this may be an embedded DRAM technology that fits over here. Basically, as you get closer to the processor, you get faster per byte. As you get farther away from the processor, you get cheaper per byte. And that's the idea of the memory hierarchy. It's very intuitive, as you can see. And this is another example uh, with my drawing over here. Basically, this is a fundamental trade-off. You have the memory hierarchy to hopefully get the, uh, get the best of the trade-offs. And as you can see, you have CPU actually also has some memory, which is the register file, which we didn't talk about. That's really the programmer-managed or compiler-managed memory, right? Whereas these caches, uh, are uh, more automatically managed memory. And clearly there are trade-offs in terms of latency, cost, size, and bandwidth. As you go from left to right, latency increases, cost reduces, size increases, and bandwidth reduces. That's how it works. Why does the bandwidth reduce? Well, bandwidth reduces because 
the demands that you need from here are a lot more. Processor accesses this maybe every cycle, right? Whereas hopefully, if your memory hierarchy is working well, you don't need to access the hard disk very often. Only once in a while you need to access it. Okay. So this works, uh, this memory hierarchy works because of the principle of locality. And locality basically means that one's recent past is a very good predictor of uh, the future. And this works in real human life as well. It's not just in, uh, just in processors. Then there are two types of locality, and we're going to exploit both types of locality in our caching algorithms. So temporal locality says basically if you did something, if you just did something, it's very likely that you will do the same thing soon. So if you just are listening to me, it's very likely that a minute from later, you're going to listen to me also. If you're not listening to me and if you're sleeping, it's very likely that in a minute later, you're going to be sleeping also. Right? So that's the temporal locality in actions. Right? Uh, another example, since you're here today, there's a good chance you will be here again and again regularly, right? Thursday and Fridays. And if you're not here today, there's a good chance that you're not going to be here again and again regularly. And I can observe that temp observe that locality from many of you. <laughs> okay, spatial locality uh, is a different form of locality. This is locality in space. So temporal locality is locality in time. Spatial locality is locality in space. This means that if you did something, it's very likely that you will do something similar or related in space. One example of this, every time I find, find one of you in this room, for example, you're probably sitting close to the same people. That's the spatial locality. That's not always true. Sometimes you guys break the spatial locality. But many of the time, it's, it's OK, actually. You may not be sitting in the same space, but you actually are sitting with the same people. But if you're sitting in the same space, that's actually even stronger spatial locality. You have a locality in the desks as well as locality in the people you're sitting with. Right? So these two examples are actually uh, translate to programs also. Basically, a typical program has a lot of locality in memory references. And the main reason is typical programs are usually composed of loops, and loops operate on similar data. So temporal locality means that a program tends to reference the same memory location many times, all within a small window of time. If you access this memory location, you're going to access it again, uh, because who knows, you're, you're going to add that location, for example, to uh, many different numbers at the same time. Right? Spatial, uh, spatial locality means, uh, or temporal locality, another example of temporal locality is in instructions, right? If you're accessing instructions in a looping manner, you're going to fetch the same instruction again and again and again and again over time because you're looping through the same instructions, right? Instructions actually exhibit a lot of temporal locality. Data also exhibits a lot of temporal locality. Spatial locality uh, is basically a program tends to reference a cluster of memory locations at the same time, cluster of memory locations that are around each other with similar memory addresses. Right. And I just give you an example from instructions, right? If you have a loop that you're iterating over, essentially what you're doing is sequential access. You're accessing PC, PC plus 4, PC plus 8, PC plus 12, PC plus 16, dot, dot, dot. And they are sequential, which means that they're spatially close in the address space, as a result, you have that spatial locality. Right? If you're accessing an array, and the array is laid out from address 0 to address m, for example, in a consecutive manner, you have spatial locality in the accesses of that array because you're accessing consecutive addresses. So it's very powerful. And I already said this, I think. Most notable examples are instruction memory references and array data structure references. OK, so these locality types are clearly different, right? Temporal locality doesn't imply anything about spatial locality. You're touching the same word. You may not be touching anything around it, but you're touching that word over and over and over and over and over again. That's temporal. Spatial doesn't imply anything about temporal locality. You're touching this word. You may not be touching that word again, but you're touching the next word around it or the previous word around it. So these are actually really orthogonal locality concepts, and we're going to use different ideas in the cache to take advantage of this, uh, of both temporal and spatial locality. You can design a cache that doesn't take advantage of one locality versus the other. But we're going to design a cache that takes advantage of both because both are locality types that exist in the programs. OK, so how do we exploit temporal locality? Uh, the first idea is very simple. If you've accessed some data, 
store that in some automatically managed fast memory. And that's called a cache. And the anticipation is that the data will be accessed again soon, which is temporal locality. Uh, and temporal locality principle says that recently accessed data will be ac again accessed in the near future. Right? And this is what Maurice Wilkes had in mind when he wrote uh, this paper that I recommended. Basically, I'm going to read it from the 1965 paper. The users discussed of a fast core memory of, say, 32,000 words as a slave to a slower core memory of, say, 1 million words in such a way that in practical cases, the effective access time is nearer that of the fast memory than that of the slow memory. So it's beautiful, right? You have a small memory that's, uh, that's essentially a cache, he doesn't use the word cache, to uh, a much larger memory, and you manage the memory automatically somehow, such that uh, most of the time, the access time is uh, similar to the access time of the small memory. Make sense? Okay, so spatial locality is different. Uh, the idea here, if you want to exploit spatial locality, uh, you store the addresses that are adjacent to the recently accessed one in automatically managed fast memory. It's very simple. Basically, you don't store this one, uh, this, uh, just this uh, word that you're accessing, but you store maybe a block that contains this word, right? That's the idea. And that's where the uh, name block comes from. We're going to store blocks of data into cache, not just single words that we've accessed. Basically, we're going to divide, logically divide memory into equal size blocks. And if we access one location within that block, we're going to bring the entire block into uh, the cache. And the anticipation is that the data that is nearby to the data that we've just accessed will be accessed soon. And this is because of the spatial locality principle, which we just discussed. Nearby data and memory will be accessed in the near future. And we've already said why this might happen. And this is uh, what uh, IBM 36085 actually implemented. This was not in uh, um, Maurice Wilkes' paper, as far as, as far as I know. And IBM 36085 had a 16 kilobyte cache with 64 byte blocks. Instructions required four bytes, but whenever uh, they accessed that four bytes, they would bring the 64 byte block this instruction belongs to into the 16 kilobyte uh, cache. And this is a beautiful paper that talks about this. Okay, any questions? I'll give you another analogy. I like this analogy because <laughs> this, uh, this, is, this is nice, this, this, hap this happens to me. Uh, basically, this is your memory hierarchy uh, of books, if you will. You may have a book in your hand, that's your register file, you're currently operating on that book. And if you're not using that book, that goes onto your desk, but and the, and the books that you're going to need soon or that you recently used stay in the desk, probably, right? That's what happens to me, at least. And if your desk overflows, then some of the books go to the bookshelf. Those are the books that are less recently used, if you will. And some books are not used that much, so they're at boxes at home. And some books you hate are in book boxes in storage, right? You never want to see them until you need them. And when you need them, you open the box in the storage and bring the book into your hand. Right. So that's the hierarchy, essentially. But clearly, that process takes a long time to open the box uh, and bring the book. Right. OK, so hopefully the computer architecture books are on your desk or in your hand. OK, so that's, that's the temporal locality aspect of it. Uh, basically, until the desk gets full, of course, uh, how do you actually manage the cache becomes important because these have limited capacity, as you can see. You can only hold so many books in your hand. You, know, you may be better than me at this. <laughs> but you can, you, can, you can hold a lot of books in your storage. In fact, essentially infinite, as long as you have the money to pay for it. Okay, so there, the spatial locality also exists over here, actually, because... Uh, Adjacent books in the shelf may be needed around the same time. If you categorize your books really well, such that maybe your computer architecture books are here, then whenever you need a computer architecture book, you may, need to, you may want to get multiple of those at the same time, right? Because I give you assignments from multiple books, and you get multiple books at the same time from the bookshelf and put it in your hand or put it in your desk, 
That's spatial locality now, right? If you didn't categorize your books well, maybe you don't have spatial locality. So spatial locality very much depends on how you laid out your data. Right? Now, this is very clear in the GPU lecture we talked about, as well as the uh, lecture we talked about uh, uh, on, on SIMD machines, right? So how effective your cache depends on how well you laid out your data. Okay, caching in a pipeline design, this is, uh, this is actually what I said earlier. Basically, uh, the level one cache is very special. It's very different from other caches over here because the level one cache needs to be tightly integrated into the pipeline. Ideally, you want to access it in one cycle so that instructions that are dependent on the load value that's to be loaded from the cache uh, do not stall. Right? As a result, uh, if you have a high frequency pipeline, you cannot make the cache large. But clearly, we want a large cache and a pipeline design, and that leads to the idea of the cache hierarchy. So this, uh, the requirements of this level one cache are dictated very much by the design of the pipeline. You don't want to make it too large, because that will require multiple cycles or many cycles to access. In fact, today's processor's caches already require a few cycles to access, but you don't want to make it too large such that it's too long to access. So you keep the size limited, by the requirements of the pipeline, but to add other cache levels uh, to, to be able to satisfy uh, the working set, if you will, that you have of, for data. Working set is the amount of data that you touch at a given time period. And ideally, you would like that working set to fit in your L1 cache. But not all the time it's possible. So you need a cache hierarchy. OK, so basically there are two points here. This cache is very special. The requirements are dictated by the design of the pipeline. Uh, so its size is limited, and its complexity is also limited. But you can make this, these other caches more complex and bigger because their requirements are not dictated as much by the pipeline. So how do you design this hierarchy it becomes a science and art at the same time. Let's talk about how do you manage this cache hierarchy or caches in general. There are two ways of managing them, clearly. One is manual programmer manages the data movement across the levels. Programmer basically says, please move the data from main memory to cache. Please move the data from L2 cache to L1 cache. Now, you don't normally do that when you program, and that's usually not the case. But th this is essentially one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is automatic. Hardware manages the data movement across the levels transparently to the programmer. Clearly, we have a trade-off again, the programmer microarchitect trade-off. Here, programmer's life is harder, but programmer has more control. Here, uh, hardware designer's life is harder, and programmer has less control. So their trade-off, well, I said it's too painful for programmers on substantial programs over here. Uh, and this was the way it was done uh, in the past. Most general purpose processors don't do this manual management because it's just too hard for the programmers. Uh, but it's still done in some embedded processors. You have, this is also called scratch pad memory. Uh, basically, you have on-chip scratch pad SRAM instead of a cache, and the programmer essentially moves the data from the memory into the scratch pad memory. The, the assumption is that programmer knows what they're doing. Right? And in some cases, that's true if the programmer knows the program really well. And if they're programming uh, an embedded system that's designing a very specific task, uh, they have to be expert programmers, maybe an anti-lock break system, for example then it may be better to have a scratch pad memory uh, that, that is actually managed by the programmer. GPUs also have this. We've discussed this. Unfortunately, they have a terrible name for it. GPU terminology I really uh, dislike sometimes. They call this shared memory. Uh, it's essentially a scratch pad memory or a cache that's managed by the programmer. And Juan talked about this earlier. So that's an example of a manually managed cache that already exists. And please don't call it shared memory, even though GPU manufacturers like calling it shared memory. Shared memory has, a, has some other meaning in general. It's shared by multiple threads, right? OK, automatic management. This is the predominant way of actually designing cache and general purpose processors. And the big plus is programmer's life is a lot easier in this case. The average programmer doesn't need to know about it. Basically, you don't need to know how big the cache is and how it works to write a correct program. But if you really want to optimize your program, if you really want to have a fast program, you'd better know about how big your cache is. Because you don't want to 
and how big your cache is as well as how, what kind of algorithms are used to actually move data into the cache by the hardware. If you know those, you can change your program, change your access patterns, change the working set of your program such that most of the time, the data that you're working on is in the L1 cache and change your data organization, right? Such that you're really making use of these blocks that are brought into the cache. So knowing all of that information that you really are not, uh, do not need to know normally enables you to write much faster programs. And a lot of compilers actually, uh, compilers are essentially programmers, if you think about it. There are some programmers that write compilers. If you want to have an optimizing compiler, you need to know the cache size and the cache management policies, cache block size, cache associativity, all of those cache parameters that we're going to talk about uh, to be able to make the program fast. Okay, so this automatic management in memory hierarchy was what uh, Morris Wilkes had in mind, actually. This is the paper uh, that I recommended. As you can see over here, we've already said that, uh, by a slave memory, slave memory is essentially the cache, I mean one which automatically accumulates to itself words that come from a slower main memory and keeps them available for subsequent use without it being necessary for the penalty of main memory access to be incurred again. So basically the keyword over here is automatically. So that was the idea that Morris Wilkes had when he designed his cache. This is not the first cache paper, interestingly. Uh, this is actually a really interesting debate. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if many people care about the debate, but people who care about history care about this debate at least. Uh, there are other cache papers. This, this last one is actually a really beautiful paper. Uh, that talks about caching, but there are also other cache papers. This talks about uh, caching at a uh, more of an op operating system level, but this, this talks about a real hardware design cache uh, over here. Okay, if you're interested, you can take a look at it. I just like going to the original source uh, of, uh, of the designs. If you find an older cache paper, please let me know. Okay, so this is what a modern memory hierarchy looks like. We've actually covered a lot of it over here by now. But register file is part of the memory hierarchy. It's small, it's manual, compiler managed, or programmer managed. Uh, and then you have the L1 cache over here. Uh, and then you have the L2 cache, L3 cache, main memory, and uh, essentially disk. So this part is automatically managed by the hardware. This part is managed by the programmer in a general purpose processor. And this part is managed by the virtual memory subsystem, which we will hopefully get to cover. That's what demand paging means. Basically, transparently to the programmer, if you run out of physical memory, somebody brings, uh, somebody manages the data between the physical memory and the disk, such that the programmer doesn't need to, doesn't have to manage the main memory uh, themselves, because that life is harder that way. So clearly, a lot of the design decisions that are made over here to, are to make programmers' life easier. All of this is automatically managed by the hardware over here and by the hardware in the system in this boundary. And this is automatically managed by the compiler in general. But if you really want to be uh, a, uh, write fast programs, you'd better know what's going on over here. In fact, knowing all of this is much more important to write fast programs today than knowing what's happening inside the pipeline, probably. And you've seen this actually in the GPU lectures, right? A lot of the optimizations were actually memory optimizations that you discussed. Okay, so how do you actually analyze the latency of this? And I say latency over here, not necessarily performance, but latency is uh, uh, easier to analyze than overall performance, because overall performance depends on the parallelism that you have as well. But let's look at the latency of this. So if you have a given memory hierarchy level i, uh, it has some intrinsic access time of ti, let's say, small ti. But the perceived access time of that level of cache, large TI, is longer than this intrinsic small TI. So small TI is the access latency of this cache itself, whereas large TI is the perceived access latency to that level. Okay, so let's take a look at that. When, you, when you're looking for a given address in a cache level, there's a chance that the access that you're doing to the cache is going to hit. This is called a hit rate. So whenever you access the cache and the cache says, oh, I have the data, here it is. That's called a hit, cache hit. In this case, you have a fraction that's called the hit rate. It could be 99%. That sounds good, right? 99% of your references hit in the cache. And those hits experience an access time of the small TI. That's the latency of that level itself, that cache itself. But if you miss, then you have some miss rate. A fraction of the access is miss. Now your access time is 
the time it takes to access this level to determine whether it's a hit or miss, plus the time it takes to access everything downstream, the next level. So now we have a hierarchical equation, as you can see. Clearly, hit, hit rate plus miss rate should be equal to one. And our access latency at level i is equal to this, hit rate times the access latency of that particular level times miss rate, uh, sorry, plus the miss rate times, parentheses, the time it takes to determine whether it's a hit, which is the access latency of that level, plus the perceived access latency of all of the levels below it. So it's a hierarchical equation. Or you can actually express it by uh, simplifying this. It's essentially the time to access this level plus miss rate times the perceived time to access the next level. This is actually an easier way of thinking about it. Basically, for whatever access, you always pay the cost of TI because you need to access the cache and get the hit-miss signal saying you hit in the cache or you missed in the cache. And if you missed in the cache, you pay some additional penalty. This is called the miss penalty, if you will, which is the hierarchical latency to access the remaining levels. And you can see that this is a hierarchical equation. If this is, if TI is, uh, if I is one, you have small t1 plus miss rate in the first level times uh, perceived access latency in the second level of the cache. And the outermost level, uh, in the outermost level, the access latency is essentially TI of the outermost level. You won't miss in the outermost level. Right? That's our assumption. Okay. And we've already said this over here. Basically, HI and MI are defined to be the hit rate and the miss rate of just the references that missed at level I minus one. Okay, basically we, what we have is a recursive latency equation. And if you want to design a hierarchy, we want to, if you want to optimize the latency in this hierarchy, we want to make some choices, right? So our goal is to achieve desired T1, level one cache hit rate. So let me go back over here. This is T1 how long it takes, uh, how much you perceive, uh, how long it takes you perceive that you're going to access uh, this level. And you have a small t1 over here, and then you have a miss rate over here. The perceived access latency over here is the sum of small t1 plus the miss rate here times the large t1, that the t2 that you have over here. That's the idea. So that's why it's hierarchical. And then you can compute the same thing over here, right? The T2 is equal to the access latency of small T2 plus miss rate from the T2, uh, from, from L2, times uh, the perceived access latency, large T3 over here. And, okay, let me go back over here, sorry. Assume that everything hits in main memory. For now, we can assume that. Then the access latency that you get over here uh, is essentially T of uh, main memory latency. So you don't have a recursive equation after this point because we assume that everything hits in main memory. That's not always true, right? But we're not gonna cover that today. So, okay, ideally you want the perceived access latency to be the same as the access latency of uh, the cache itself at that level, right? Which means that ideally you don't wanna miss in the cache. Ideally t large T1 should be equal to small T1. But clearly that's not possible, you're, go you're gonna miss in the cache. If you're gonna miss in the cache, you'd better try to keep the miss rate low at that level. And if you miss, you also want to keep uh, the perceived access latency in the next level low. So how do you do that? Uh, there's a trade-off. That's the unfortunate part over here. It's not easy to optimize. If you want to keep the miss rate low, you want to increase capacity. Now that lowers the miss rate, but it increases the access latency, right, in the next level. So these go against each other, as you can see. Now you can try to lower the miss rate without increasing capacity by being more smarter in the management of the cache. And we're going to see that. What does smarter mean? For example, uh, you anticipate what you don't need and don't bring it into the cache. That's one way. Or you kick out stuff that you don't need quickly from the cache. You're more intelligent in your management. Right. Or you can prefetch into your cache, which we're not going to cover. You anticipate what you will need and bring the data early into the cache. We're going to see replacement and eviction algorithms that uh, 
try to kick out the right thing from the cache, but it's not that easy. And actually, existing processors use very, very sophisticated techniques that are beyond what we're going to cover in this course. Okay, if you want to keep uh, the perceived access time of the next level low, then you want to make the lower hierarchies or outer hierarchies uh, faster. But if you want to make them faster, now you're increasing the cost. There's another equation over here that we didn't talk about cost, right? There's a within a lot cost over here. And as a result, you usually introduce intermediate levels to compromise. As a result, what we have today is an L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache, L4 cache, and a main memory. Right. So, okay, basically, uh, it's dictated by this equation over here. And this equation, remember, just considers the latency of access, right? It doesn't say anything about parallelism of access. That's why this equation is not really correlated fully with performance. This is the latency of access of a given request. If multiple requests are happening in parallel, some of that latency may not matter. Right? So the performance is really a lot more complex to analyze than latency, but latency is clearly easier because you can write an equation like this. Okay, so let me give you an example from real life. This is Intel Pentium 4. Uh, this is circa 1999, 2000, right? Uh, and it's 3.6 gigahertz. These are some of the parameters that they used in their caches. L1 data cache, capacity is 16 kilobytes. Uh, the intrinsic access latency of the cache is four cycle for integer operations and nine cycles for FP operations because FP requires larger cache blocks, actually. But we're going to look at integer over here. L2 data cache, the cache size is one megabyte and intrinsic access time is 18 cycles for integer loads. Main memory, let's assume that it's about 50 nanoseconds, which is really uh, an unrealistic assumption, actually, on average, because main memory is usually much, much slower, but 180 cycles, that's our assumption. And I'm gonna assume that everything hits in main memory. And notice here that the best case latency is not one, right? The, the latency over here is a minimum of four. So it takes four cycles to get the data from the L1 cache because this is a very high frequency design, especially at the time. We're talking about 2001 or so here. And the worst case access latencies are into 500 plus cycles. Uh, and that's true for many, many processors today. So you really want to manage your cache well so that you don't experience the 500 plus cycles access latency for equations. Let's take a look at, let's have some fun with these numbers over here. If we do the hierarchical, uh, equation over here. If our miss rate from the first level is 10%, if our miss rate on the second level is also 10%, these are the perceived access latency you would get for a load or store. At this level, it's 7.6. At this level, it's 36. Well, how do you get this equation? Well, let's take a look at T2 over here. You need to start with the outermost level. Right? Outermost level, let's say uh, main memory, T3, the perceived access latency is the same as T3 over here. It's 180 cycles. Now, this level, T2, large T2, the perceived access latency is equal to hit latency uh, or intrinsic latency, which is 18, plus miss rate, 0 0.1, times outer level perceived access latency, large T3. So it's 18 plus 0 0.1 times 180 which is 18 plus 18, it's 36. So perceived access latency at the L2 level is at 36. Now we have that, we can calculate the perceived access latency at the L1 level. What is that? It's, so large T1 equals small uh, T1, which is four, plus uh, miss rate times the perceived access latency at this level. So it's four times, zero point, uh, four plus 0 0.1 times 36, so it's 7.6. Okay, so with this miss rate, that's what you get. This is a high miss rate, actually. 90% hit rate in the L1 cache is not good because every instruction perceives, gets a perceived access latency of 7.6 cycles. So if you have 99% hit rate in both levels, your perceived access latency is very close to the intrinsic access latency of level one. That's good, right? And you don't really fully care about what's here. here. Now, if your hit rate is 95% or miss rate is 5% uh, over here, you quickly go up to five cycle perceived access latency, which is not good. So you can see that 
a very small difference in the miss rate going from 0.01 to 0.05 actually increases your time to access the cash, the cash hierarchy by a lot. Or uh, you could, uh, but here you need to ensure that your miss rate in the second level is 99%. You can get a similar number for the perceived access latency at level one if your numbers look like this. So if your miss rate at the first level is 99%, uh, so, sorry, miss rate is 1%, and if your miss rate in the second level is 50%, so this gives you, this, uh, this intuitively gives you something, right? Because the miss rate at the second level applies to accesses that miss in the first level. The miss rate over here doesn't really matter as much, right? As long as your hit rate over here is large or miss rates at the first level is small. So your small cache, the management of your small cache matters a lot. And if you manage your first level cache really well, then maybe you don't need to manage your second level cache as well. But this is hard to do, of course. So people usually need to manage all levels really well. But the moral of the story over here is that if your first level cache is doing well, your second level cache doesn't need to be doing well. And if your first level cache is not doing slightly well, your second level cache better do really well. <laughs> That's the idea. And it's a complex optimization problem because you can always add levels, right? Okay. That's a good place to stop and take a 10 minute break, and then we'll talk about how the cache is actually designed. Okay, let's, let's continue. Now we're going to look into the cache basics and operation. Actually, we've covered a lot of basics, but now we're going to become more structural and look at how a cache is designed uh, underneath, essentially. So I already said what the cache is, but uh, caches are actually much more general uh, than processor design, right? Caches exist everywhere because the principle of locality holds, as you've seen in human life as well, right? For example, we have web caches today. If you actually access the website, your browser caches your data in memory somewhere or in, even in hard disk, depending on where it caches the data, because the anticipation is that you're going to access that web page again, right? And then they load the cached web page, right? They actually do prefetching. Whenever you access uh, a web page, they might prefetch some of the links, some of the website earlier, and they may put it into the memory, right? So the principles are actually very similar in the larger system design as well, not just in the processors. Even though a lot of the concepts were first developed within the context of computer architecture, the processor design. Uh, essentially, a cache is any structure that memorizes or memoizes or remembers frequently or recently used results, depending on your policy, to avoid repeating the long latency operations required to reproduce the results or load the results from scratch. That's a mouthful of a, a general cache definition. And they exist everywhere. Uh, so most commonly in the processor design con context, it's, it refers to an automatically managed memory st structure based on SRAM, as we've discussed. And the idea is to memoize or remember an SRAM the most frequently or recently accessed DRAM memory locations to avoid repeatedly paying for the DRAM access latency. That's the idea. And I keep saying most frequently or recently because this really depends on the policy of how, what, what data you bring into the cache and what, the, what data do you keep into the cache. So there are many, many design choices, some of which we're going to examine, some of which we don't have time to examine. So the basics, basically I've already described what a block is, but to more formally define a block, this is also called a line, the terminology is different. I think IBM terminology calls it a line. Other terminology calls it a block, but that's fine, block or line. Uh, this is the unit of storage in the cache. Memory is logically divided into blocks or cache blocks that map to locations in the cache. And a block is, it could be the size of a word. It could be a much bigger size. For example, in today's caches, 64-byte blocks uh, are very common. A lot of the Intel processors have 64-byte blocks. But that's not the only block size. It could be 256 byte blocks. Clearly, if you want to capture larger spatial locality, you want your block size to be larger also. Right? So on a reference, you get a hit or miss on an access to the cache. There are two outcomes. One is a hit. If the block address that you're querying the cache with is in the cache, then you take the data instead of accessing memory. If it's a miss, then you bring the block into the cache. Now, where is the 
Where do you bring the block into the cache? You normally go to the next cache level. It may or may not be in that cache level, and then go to the next cache level, and then go to the next cache level. <laughs> Clearly, where does, where does a block get placed uh, also is a design choice. Of course, when you miss, if you need to bring data into the cache, you may have to kick something else out to do it, right? If in this location, you're searching for this block, and it's, uh, you're, you look in this location, the block is supposed to be in this location. If it's not in that location, but if there's some other block in that location, and if you want to bring the block that you're accessing into that location, you need to kick out that block that is already in that location because you have limited space. This is called replacement, replacing the block that is already in the cache. There are many important cache design decisions. Some of them are like this. Placement, where and how to place or find a block into the in the cache. We're going to look at examples of placement. This depends on how do you index into the cache and how do you search the cache. And in hardware, you want to be simple, so we're going to look at very simple structures. In a web cache, you may be much less simple. Right? Replacement, what data to remove to make room in the cache if you don't have room in that particular place where you're supposed to store the block that you're trying to bring. This is also called eviction, replacement. Granularity of management, do you have large blocks or small blocks, or do you have what is called sub-blocks? We're going to hopefully see sub-blocks if we have time. What is the right granularity? Usually the granularity is fixed in processor caches because it's a lot easier to manage fixed size blocks. But if you look at a web cache, a software cache, your granularity doesn't need to be fixed. Sometimes you load one megabyte of data, sometimes you load five bytes of data, right? But that's very hard to do in hardware. It's a lot easier to deal with fixed granularity blocks in hardware. That's why I say 64 byte blocks, right? I don't say sometimes 16 byte blocks, sometimes one megabyte blocks. That's a lot harder to manage in hardware. Write policy, what do you do about the writes? We're going to hopefully talk about that. Instructions and data, do we treat them separately? And some things that do not fit here, some, some of you asked earlier, if you have a multi-level cache hierarchy, what do you do? When you bring the data, do you actually include, bring the data all, to all of the cache levels, or do you bring the data into the topmost cache level, L1 cache level, and to none of the other cache levels? And when this data gets evicted from here, maybe it trickles down to the remaining cache levels. That's also a design decision, which we're not going to talk about but all of these have implications on performance and energy efficiency and cost. Okay, so let's take a look at the abstract view of the cache. Essentially, we have an address. We supply this address. I'll call this a block address. Uh, and we index the cache. And cache consists of two components, tag store and a data store. Data store essentially stores the memory blocks. If the memory block exists in the cache, you're going to get the data out from here. And then you can choose a piece of the block, right? Depending on which byte you're accessing in the block. Now, tag store answer the questions, answers the question, is this address in the cache? So this is really the data structure that you need to query. Address gets indexed into the tag store, and you take a tag store entry, and that tag store entry says, oh, this is valid, and you have a tag match. This is called a tag store because you really need to match the address. Uh, that you're looking up with to the address that's stored in the cache. That's the idea. And there's also some bookkeeping information that you have to do replacement and eviction, dot, dot, dot. We will see that. Uh, and the tag store's answer is whether you hit or miss in the cache. Normally, you access these in parallel, especially in the L1 cache. You basically send the address to the tag store, index it, get a tag, do the tag comparison. And this tag comparison results in a hit or miss. And while that's happening, you also index the data store and get the data block that is at that index of the address. We will see that index. You get the data. And if this is a hit, the data is correct. You can trust it. If this is a miss, you discard the data because that data that you actually accessed in the data store is not something that you need. So the key, uh, the latency is really here in the tag store. You get a hit latency. Uh, and the hit latency is used to get the data, uh, well, not get the data, select the right data that you've actually uh, taken out of the data store. Okay? So clearly, this, even this is a design choice, right? I said you access the tag store and data store in parallel. If you're always missing in the cache, that's not a good idea, right? Because you're accessing the data store in a very useless way. So what happens 
in L1 caches than most modern processors, you access the tax store and the data store in parallel because you, you're likely to hit in the cache. And if you hit in the cache, you want to get the data right away. You don't want to do this serially. After you hit in the cache, you don't want to start an access to the data store because if you do that, you increase your latency. You pay the tax store latency plus the data store access latency. It's much better to do it in parallel. But if you're at the L3 level, L4 level, let's say, let's say your miss rate is 50%, and usually that's the case, actually, then, and these tax stores and data stores are huge at that level because you may have a 32 megabyte cache. In that case, most processors actually implement a serial tax store and data store access, which means that they first check the tax store and only if it's a hit, they access the data store. Why? Because this is bad for latency, clearly, because now you're serializing the tag and data access latency, but this is good for energy efficiency. You don't want to access a huge structure uh, only to figure out that 50% of the time you didn't really need to access it. Right? So that's the trade-off that's made, and that's one of the reasons why L1 cache is very different from L3, L4 caches, for example. The design decisions that you make in these caches are very, very different to each other. Okay, we've already discussed this basically. Cache hit rate, at this, at, we're looking at only one level here. It's the number of hits divided by number of hits plus misses, or number of accesses. And the average memory access time is essentially the equation that we had before. It's written in a different way over here. It's the hit rate times hit latency plus miss rate times miss latency. And this miss latency actually includes the hit latency because you need to go through the tag store. But of course, these latencies differ depending on if you, whether or not you do the serial access or parallel access of the tag and data store. Okay, one aside, I've already answered this uh, in some way, but we may, we may get back to it. Uh, the key question is, average memory access time is used to design a memory hierarchy in general, but is reducing it always beneficial for performance? And the answer is no, because this only takes into account access time, latency, right? As I said before, there are a lot of other things that is going on in the machine, parallelism, for example, that affects your performance. You may actually be missing in the, in the cache, but then, uh, and the latency that you have for this request may be 500 cycles because you missed all levels. And the latency that you have for this next request is also 500 cycles because you missed all levels, but they're served in parallel in different banks in main memory, which means that you don't really have 500 plus 500 cycle latency. You really have 500 plus a change latency because most of the service time of these two requests that are in main memory are in parallel because you have banking, right? So, okay, you should always be careful, basically. Average memory access time is a good first order indicator of how your latency behaves, but not necessarily your performance. Okay, let's go through a basic hardware cache design. Basically, we will start with a basic hardware cache design, and then we'll ex examine, hopefully, as time permits, a multitude of ideas to make it better. And if you want to examine many, many more ideas, that's the master's level computer architecture course. So basically, uh, as I said, memory is logically divided into fixed size blocks. That's what I'm going to assume. And each block maps to a location in the cache. And it's determined by the index bits in the address. So you have an address for each block, and part, some of the bits in the address determine the in, are called the index bits. That's how you, what you use to index into the tag store and the data store. So you use, the index, you use these index bits to index into the tag and data stores. I'm going to show you a picture in a little bit. So this is one example, basically. This is an 8-bit address. Uh, there's something called byte in block that consists of three bits, assuming this is byte addressable. This means that, you, uh, actually, by just looking at this address, you can tell how many bytes there are in your block, right? It's two to three. You have eight bytes in a block. Uh, and by just looking at this, you also tell how many indices there are. There are eight possible indices that you have uh, in the cache. And this is your tag. We're going to see what happens with the tag in a little bit. So in order to access the cache, you use the index to index a location in the cache, one of zero through seven, one of eight. And then you check whether the tag stored in that location matches the tag that you have in the address. If the tag stored in that location matches the tag you have in that address, uh, then essentially you have a cache hit because you've indexed that location, the tag is stored there, it's the same as the tag that you're trying to access for this block, then you have a hit. Make sense? We'll see an example of it more. Yeah, I've already said this basically. 
to, for, to do the cache access, you index into the tag and data stores with the index bits and the address with these bits. Check the valid bit. I didn't say that, but you need to have a valid bit also because uh, that basically tells you whether you've actually put something valid into your cache. And sometimes you may want to invalidate the location, which we're not going to get into right now. But initially, everything in the cache is invalid because you didn't put anything into your cache. As you start putting things into your cache, you set the valid bit and set the tag bits for that particular block at a particular index. You check the valid bit in the tag store, and if the valid bit says I'm valid, you compare the tag bits and the address with the stored tag in the tag store. You basically compare this part of the address with the stored tag in the tag store. We're going to give, uh, give an example. So if a block is in the cache, which means that it's a cache hit, then the stored tag should be valid and match the tag of the block, which means that you've already brought that block into the cache. Now this tells you whenever you bring a block into the cache, you do essentially the same indexing. You, index, you, you have an address for the block. You use the index, these three bits, to index into the cache. And then you set the valid bit. And then you set the tag bits to be this way. And then you put the data into the corresponding index in the data store. Of course, you need to do something else before this. What if there was something valid in the cache? Right. We'll answer that question also. OK, so we'll start with the simplest form of the cache. That's called a direct map cache. Direct map cache means that a cache block in a part of memory can be mapped to only one possible location in the cache. That's called direct mapped. You're directly mapping a potential block address to a single possible location in the cache. So let's assume, let's, uh, let, let's be concrete. Let's assume that we have byte addressable memory. We're going to be toy. Uh, it's a toy example. We have only 256 bytes in our memory. And our blocks are eight byte blocks, which means that our memory has 32 total number of blocks. Well, in modern memories, it's not like that clearly, right? We may have a four gigabyte memory. Four gigabytes is two to the 32. Uh, even that's small by today's standards, right? Uh, my old computer has four gigabytes memory. You, yours might have 32 gigabytes of memory. Uh, but four gigabytes, OK? Uh, and you may have 64 byte blocks. So four gigabyte, two to the 32, divided by 64, two to the six is two to the 26 blocks. So your main memory is really divided to two to the 26 blocks, right? So this is our main memory. This is actually the entirety of the 256 byte memory. And I've shown you the blocks over here. So this is block address zero. Uh, it has eight bytes over here inside memory. This is block address one, block address two, dot, dot, dot. This is block address eight. This is block address 16. This is block address 24. And I decided to mark these because I'm going to design a cache where these blocks actually have to go to the same location in the cache because of the way we're indexing into the cache. OK, assume that we have a cache that has 64 bytes and eight blocks. Well, what does this mean? Uh, if it's a direct map cache, a block can go to only one location, and the cache looks like this. So 64 bytes, eight blocks, uh, which means that you have eight locations over here, and each of them is eight bytes. We already said that. We have eight byte blocks, right? So that's good. Direct map means a block can go to only one location. And Here's how it can go. So in the tag store, we have a valid bit, and we have a tag. In the data store, we have the data associated uh, with that tag. And when we get an address, this is what the address looks like. Uh, basically, this is the byte inside the block. Our block size is 8 bytes. Uh, our index is 3 bits, and we use this index to decide which of these 8 the block, uh, which of these eight blocks we should check in the tag store to determine the presence of the address. Make sense? So this is what's used to index the tag store. And this is what's used to do the tag matching. So if you look over here, I've highlighted these blocks that have the same index. Block 0, 8, 16, and 24 have the same index bits. In a direct map cache, they can only be placed in the same location, where the same location is this index location zero. OK. So this is how you access the cache. You index using the three bits, uh, the tag store and the data store. You get the tag and the valid bits. You get the data. You take the tag in the address. You do the tag comparison. Uh, 
If the val bit is true and the tag matches, you get a hit. And if you get a hit, your data is good. Now, you're, maybe you're accessing only a single byte. You decide which byte to, ch which byte to select using a mux uh, that, is, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that uses the three bits as a select input over here. Make sense? It's very simple, basically. Now, this is very simple. This is perhaps one of the simplest caches you can get because it's direct mapped. A block can go to only one location. So the, all of the blocks that have index bits that, that are all zeros can go to only this tag store location and only this data store location. All of the blocks that have index bits that are 0, 0, 1 can go to only this location, 0, 0, 1, with index 0, 0, 1, and data store location with index 0, 0, 1 in the cache. So you have a one-to-one -one mapping, essentially. Uh, not one-to-one -one mapping. Basically, uh, four-to-one mapping in this case. Four blocks over here map to the same location. The next four blocks map to the next location. The next four blocks map to the next location, as you can see. Which means that addresses that have the same index contend for the same location. This could be a problem, right? So this causes conflict misses. For example, let's assume that our access pattern is such that the processor is accessing address zero first. OK, let, let's first assume that it's a nice pattern. Let's first assume that you're addressing, uh, accessing address zero. What happens? You bring uh, the block into this location, because it has index zero, and the data into this location, you set the valid bit, you set the tag to be 0, 0, and all is good. The next time you access 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 block, that's great, you hit in the cache. The next time you access 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, again, you hit in the cache. That's the benefit. Now, if you want to access blocks 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, what you need to do is you index the cache, you go to this location, it's valid, but the tag doesn't match because you brought address 0, right? previously. Tag doesn't match, so now you need to bring this block into the cache. You kick out this one. We're going to talk about kicking out later on. Uh, you kick out that one, and you bring this block now. Tag becomes 01. This is still valid, and the data becomes the, uh, the data of the block in this memory location, in this uh, block in memory. Now what happens if your access pattern is such that you access block 0 and then block 8? And then block zero again, and then block eight. And then block zero again, and then block eight. Block zero again, block eight. Now you're screwed. You get zero percent hit rate in your cache, right? Yes. Uh, can you tell me when you say you bring the block into the cache mm -hmm. in reference to this picture, where in this picture shall the one block that you bring into the cache? So okay, so bringing a block into the cache means that uh, you bring the data, which is eight bytes in that memory location, that's eight bytes, right? You put it into the data store, you set the valid bit in the associated index of that block address, and you set the tag over here in the tag store. So you need to store the data that's associated with the block. You do that in the data store. Uh, you do that in the data store, and in the tag store, you store the tag associated with the block in the index associated with the block. And index is uh, 0 through 7 over here. This is 0, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, dot, dot, dot. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. How many blocks can, can be in the cache? So if you look at this cache, that's, that's 8 blocks here, right? Okay. It's actually meant to be exactly the same size. The whole memory can be in no, not in this case. The whole memory has 32 blocks, as you can see. So if you look at the numbers, this is 256 bytes, eight byte blocks, we have 32 blocks in memory, but the cache can house only eight blocks. Okay? okay? okay. Makes sense. Okay, so because the cache can house only a smaller number of blocks, some blocks map to the same location over here because they have the same index bits. So if you're accessing block zero and then block eight, and then again back block zero, block eight, block zero, block eight, what is happening is they both need to be stored in index zero of the tag store and index zero of the data store. But you cannot store two things over there, two blocks over there. You could have only space for one block, which means that you're going to bring block zero first, 
The next axis is to block eight. You're going to kick out block zero. You're going to bring block eight. The next axis is to block zero. You're going to kick out block eight. You're going to bring block zero. And you keep doing that, and your cache is useless. You get 0% hit rate. Even though you may be accessing only those two blocks, and you have enough space in other indices of your cache. Yes? Uh, hold, hold, on, uh, hold off on that a second. I'll, I'll, I'll solve this problem uh, in a little bit. I, I'm not sure if your idea is very similar to the solution that I have in mind. Okay? Okay, so this is called a conflict miss. Conflict miss is two blocks that you're accessing are conflicting in the same index because of the design of the cache in this case, right? And there are many ways of solving it. We're going to solve this by actually designing the tag store and the data store in a different way. The reason this happens is you have only one, one place to store a block in the cache. Only if we had two places, then we would be able to store both address zero and address eight. How do we do that? Well, actually, before going into that, I'll uh, recap the problem. Two blocks in memory that map to the same index in the cache cannot be present in the cache at the same time, because one index can store only one entry. That's the fundamental problem. And as I said, this can lead to a 0% hit rate if more than one block is accessed in an interleaved manner that, uh, mapped to the same index. And I've already said that. Right? A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. They conflict in the cache index, and all access are conflict misses. You get 0% hit rate. So the idea to, to solve this problem is called set associativity. It's a mouthful. But basically, the observation that addresses 0 and 8 always conflict in the direct map cache. Because we have a column of eight. Basically, we have eight indices, and one thing can be stored in all of those eight. But if instead of that, if we had two columns of four blocks that look like this, we could store both elements in the same index, or both blocks in the same index. And that's the idea of set associativity. The basic idea is an index can store two blocks. And that's called a set now. And similarly, data, data store needs to have these two columns. Now, clearly, as you've seen, we have reduced number of indices over here because we can we set the cache size as eight blocks. Index 00, zero maps to over here. But all addresses that have index 00, zero can be stored either here or here now in the tag store, in the data store here or here. Basically, we've provided more locations in the same index to house two pieces of, two, two blocks. And now whenever you access the cache, the access sequence is like this. You take the index, you index into the cache. Let's assume your index is zero. Basically, if your index is zero, you bring the valid bit over here and the tag over here. That's one of the possible locations. You bring the valid bit over here and the tag over here, and you do two comparisons, because the block can be either here or here. Now, this is, these are called ways. This is called way zero or way one, way zero or way one. And you may hit in either one, hopefully not both, because you don't want to store the same block in both. Uh, and some logic determines whether you hit. And if you hit in this way, you should get the data from this uh, way in the data store. If you hit in this way of the tag store, you should get the data from this way in the data store. If you miss, then this data is useless, essentially. And then you max out the byte and block over here. Now, the key idea over here is you have associative memory within the set. If you look, look at this, you're really doing a tag match, tag comparison across two elements in the set, or two ways in the set. That's associative memory, uh, which is associative, associatively searching the tags. Now, this accommodates conflicts better because now address zero can go here, address eight can go here. Right. If, you're, if your access pattern is such that 0808808, you will have both of them in the cache. The downside is now you're more complex, you're slower access because you've added these additional tag comparators. That increases your uh, access latency through this logic path, and you have a larger tag store as well. So we're going to, uh, we've reduced, hopefully, these conflict misses, but we're, we're paying a penalty. Now you can say the same question. 
oh, what if I had A, B, C, D, or A, B, C mapping to the same index? I can store only two blocks in the same index, but I keep repeatedly accessing A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, the same problem. And how do you solve that problem? Well, instead of having two columns of four blocks, I have four columns of two blocks. So this one is called a two-way associative cache. If you want to increase it to be higher, you get a four-way associative cache. Basically, the idea is this is a tag store. This is index zero and index one. Now you, only one bit determines the index and the address. And likelihood of conflict misses are even lower. Now you can accommodate A, B, C, D, and the access patterns like A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, which is good. But the complexity of the logic now has increased. You have more tag comparators, larger tag stores, and wider muxes, as you can see over here. Now, if you take it to the extreme in the cache design that we have, you get full associativity. This is a fully associative cache. And the idea is a block can be placed in any cache location, which means that we eliminate the index bits. You don't index into the cache anymore. It's fully associative in terms of the tags. Basically, it looks like this. Your tag store looks like this. You have eight tags, uh, eight tag store entries, and you compare the tag and val bits of all of them. And based on that, in, par in parallel, you access all the data store entries also, and you mux out the right one, depending on what this logic says. This is the most flexible cache design, clearly. There are no conflict misses here, because you're limited by the capacity of your cache. There is no index bit. You're really not conflicting uh, with anyone else, if you will. You're really limited by the capacity. So now you can actually sustain accesses like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and that repeated. But you cannot sustain accesses like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. So if you're doing repeating through nine blocks, well, you're out of luck. You don't have any more space in your cache. You need to increase the size of your cache to be able to accommodate access patterns that are larger than that. So we've gone from direct map caches to fully associative caches. Clearly, there's a trade-off. Fully associative caches don't have conflict misses. They have capacity misses, but they're more complex. Whereas direct map caches suffer most from the conflict misses because more blocks map to the same index in that case, but they're the simplest to design because there's no need for, there's only need for one single tag comparison as opposed to n tag comparisons. Now, clearly, let's go back to a real cache today. Uh, uh, let, let's assume that we have a 32 megabyte cache. I'll start with that. 32 megabytes is 2 to the 25, right? And let's assume that we have a 2 to the 6 byte cache block. That means that we have 2 to the 19 blocks. Does it make sense to have a fully associative cache? That means that you need to have 2 to the 19 comparators. That's a lot of comparators. So that's why we don't have fully associative caches at that level at least. In fact, even at the L1 level, we don't have fully associative caches. The largest associativities are usually on the order of 32, maybe 64, but usually they're even lower. Pentium 4, for example, had an eight-way associative cache. And even that eight-way was getting in the way, if you will, uh, because it had a very high-frequency design. They weren't able to uh, fit these tag, compar tag comparisons into one cycle or even several cycles because the frequency of the design was very high. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. Uh, it's, it's kind of nice because it's the way you think about how you organize the blocks. Is it either a single column of eight, or is it a single row of eight? Single column of eight is direct map, single row of eight is fully associative, and anything in between has different levels of associativity. So a degree of associativity essentially determines how many blocks can map to the same index. And I've introduced some terminology along the way. The blocks that map to the same index same uh, are also called a set. If you have higher associativity, usually you get a higher hit rate in your cache, but you increase the latency of your cache access. Remember that equation? Your miss rate reduces, but your intrinsic TI, small t, increases, uh, both the hit latency and the data access latency. And you get more expensive hardware as well. And usually what you get is diminishing returns from higher associativity. Of course, this is very much dependent on the workload that you're executing, right? You may actually write a workload that has no conflict misses. So having, knowing your cache uh, enables you to optimize your software as well. If you know your cache is direct map, maybe you should write 
software in a different way, such that you don't have the direct map, or maybe you should map your data in a different way, such that you don't really get through these conflicts, right? So it, clearly this depends on the workload, but averaged across many, many workloads, the curve usually looks like this. As you increase associativity, now I'm gonna throw a marketing graph at you. I, I joke with companies usually when they don't have numbers in their access, but <laughs> this, is, this is a case where I cannot have numbers in the access because I don't know all the workloads. But essentially, uh, as, as associativity increases, going from uh, direct map to two-way actually buys you a lot. Going from two-way to four-way buys you a little bit more. Going from four to eight-way buys you a little bit more, and then you get diminishing returns in the hit rate. That's usually the case. That's not always the case. Sometimes you may have an access pattern where if you have associativity 16, that's great. But if you have associativity eight, you get 0% hit rate, right? Sometimes you have jumps, depending on the program. It all depends on the reference pattern of the program, right? Okay. And clearly, programs are more complex than the reference patterns that I'm indicating right now. So there's a lot of complexity in the analysis of the caches. So let's talk about some issues in set associative caches. Uh, I'd like to think about uh, each block in a set having a priority. How important is this block in a set? Now we're going to talk about a single block in a set. Yeah, how important is it to keep the block in the cache? Or you can think of this as an indication of how likely is this block uh, going to be referenced earliest in the future. Ideally, the block that you're going to be going to reference uh, first into the future should have the highest priority, right? Which means that you should not kick it out. You should do as much as possible to keep it in the cache. Okay? This is assuming, again, latency is the most important thing. Key issue is how do you determine or adjust the block priorities? So we're going to add some bookkeeping information to the tax store now. Uh, there are three key decisions you need to make in a set, actually. One is, well, insertion, promotion, and eviction, replacement. Insertion means what happens to the priorities when you put a block into the set? How do you change the priorities? Where do you insert the incoming block? Whether or not to insert the block. We, we didn't even talk about this, but uh, sometimes the process bypass caches, which means that they decide not to insert the block into the cache because they may predict that this block is not going to be used in the future. Promotion means what happens to priorities on a cache hit. Let's say you access the cache, you hit on the block. How do you change the priorities? Because this, is a, this gives you more information, right? This tells you, I just used this block. What should I do next? Is this an indication of, oh, I'm going to use the block again? Or is this an indication of, I'm going to use some other block again? Again, it depends on the access patterns. But usually, uh, so usually, okay, I'll give you the usual decisions. Usually insertion, uh, we use the LRU mechanism, least recently used mechanism. So whenever you insert a block, the, least, the most recently used block becomes the highest priority and the least recently used block becomes the lowest priority. That's one policy. Promotion means whenever you touch a block, you promote it to be the least recently used, that becomes the highest priority. And you change the priorities of everything else such that you maintain an order of recency of use. Of course, now this is complex, right? Okay, whether and, whether and how to change the block priority, but you clearly have a choice of whether also. And eviction and replacement, what happens to priorities on a cache miss? Which block do you evict, and how do you adjust the priorities? Because if you have a set associative cache, let's say you have two blocks to evict, A or B, and now you're bringing in C. Which one do you evict, A or B? If, you're, if you have a least recently used policy that, that says that you should keep the block that is least recent, uh, you should evict the block that's least recently used. So you need to keep track of the recency of use. That's one policy. Okay. So let's talk about that. Which block in the set to replace on a cache miss? Well, if you have an invalid block, that's probably a good idea. You just write the data over there, which means that you're really not evicting anything. You're just putting the data into a location that happened to be invalid for whatever reason. Right. So that's a good idea. That, that way you don't evict anything, right? But if all blocks are valid in the set, you consult what is called a replacement policy. And people have developed many, many replacement policies over the course of, I don't know, 50, 60 years almost. And uh, caching is a very hot topic. Clearly, it's important. But it could be random, for example. You randomly pick one of the blocks in the set. It's very simple, right? 
And it turns out this performs not so bad. <laughs> or you can, use, you can use policies like first in, first out, least recently used, what I just discussed. A lot of the caches initially started implementing least recently used or approximations of it because uh, the, the prediction is that if you, uh, again, this is based on the temporal locality principle, right? If you use something recently, you're going to use it again. If you have not used something recently, you're not going to use it for a really long time. So least recently used policy makes sense from that perspective. In practice, it's not always the best. Uh, so people also implement not most recently used. That's also based on the temporal locality principle. But maybe it doesn't maintain the strict ordering between all of the blocks in the set. Least frequently used. People actually looked at how to potentially implement frequency. But this requires counting, right? Uh, how, what is the frequency of use of different cache blocks? So you can see that these may be not so easy to implement. So I'll give you some ideas over here without going into detail, but cost is another thing that may be uh, important to take into account, especially in modern caches, because some cache block, uh, if you evict it from this level of cache, maybe you can access it easily from memory, because it may be in the local memory of this node, of this processor. But some other cache block, it may actually need to be brought I don't know, from the local memory of some other processor. So it takes much longer to fetch. So taking that into account in the replacement policy may be important. That's one example of why memory access may have different costs. There are other examples which we're not going to go into. So people actually have developed hybrid replacement policies just like hybrid branch predictors, right? You have different algorithms to uh, manage uh, to do the replacement and you pick the best one that you think is going to do well. Let's talk about optimal replacement policy a little bit, uh, in a little bit. Okay, LRU, basically the idea is to evict the least recently accessed block. The problem is you need to keep track of access ordering of blocks if you want to do this perfectly. Okay, the question is, if you have a two-way set of cache, what do you need to implement LRU perfectly? How many bits do you need to store in the tax store to tell you which, uh, which way houses the least recently used block? One, exactly. It's only one per tax store entry. If it's zero, the least recently used block is in way zero. If it's one, the least recently used block is in way one. That's it. It's simple. What about a four-way associative cache? How many bits do you need to store in the tax store to implement LRU perfectly? Now, this is harder, I guess. Any guesses? Yes? Two where? <laughs> two per each tax store entry. I would have said two in total. Two in total. Sounds like you have some magic. <laughs> so you need to remember, you need to store all possible orderings, right? Because you have, let's say, four ways. Now think about how many possible orderings you may have. The one, this one might be the most recently used. And this one must be, might be the second most recently used. This one might be the third most recently used. This one might be the last most recently used. But this one still might be the most recently used. But the second most recently used might be this one. And the third most recently used might be this one. And the fourth one might be this one. There are many combinations. So it's really combinatorial. And the answer is, <laughs> the most recently used block can be four possible things. Once you actually fix that, the second most recently used block can be three possible things. And once you actually fix that, the next most recently used block can be two possible things. And once you actually fix that, the last one is one possible thing. So it's really four factorial, which means that there are 24 possible different orderings across these four different blocks. And you could actually do the same assessment over here. We didn't do it that way, but you actually have only two ways. There are only two possible orderings, right? Either this one is the most recently used and this one's the next most recently used, or the other way around. So you need only one bit for two possible orderings. But for four ways, you need four factorial possible orderings, and that's 24 possible orderings, and that's a, a lot of complexity. Yeah, uh, so I've already said this, which means that if there are 24 possible orderings, you need to really log two to the 24 uh, ceiling number of bits, right? which is five bits to encode the 24 possible orderings. You, need, you have these five bits per the entire set. You don't have it for every text or entry 
And of course, the logic now becomes harder. Uh, which, which, which block you should evict? You need to figure out which one's the LRU based on all those possible orderings. So you need to have a decoder that says, oh, based on the ordering that I have now stored, this is the block that I should evict. Yes? No, the, the, set, the, 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 the ordering tracks, uh, what is the ordering of the blocks within the set, right? Within. Exactly, within the set. So for each set, you have uh, five bits, essentially. But your logic becomes more complex. So in general, most modern processors don't implement true LRU because of this reason, because this is complex. If you go to eight way, it's eight factorial. If you go to 16 way, it's 16 factorial. If you go to 32 way, it's 32 factorial. And these are huge numbers, as you can see. So what they usually do is they uh, have, as we've said over here, well, there are two reasons, actually. One is true LRU is very complex, and the second is LRU is an approximation to predict locality anyway. It's not necessarily the best possible cache management policy. Uh, so they use things like not MRU, which is a lot simpler to implement. Basically, you need to keep track of the most recently used block and nothing else. And that's relatively easy to do. Or they use hierarchical LRU, which I'm not going to go into. Basically, divide the N way set into M groups and track the MRU group and the MRU way in each group. This is a little bit more information than not MRU, so hopefully you do better. But it's not as much information as a perfect ordering, LRU ordering. Or they use something like victim, next victim replacement. They only keep track of the victim and the next victim. Most recently used and next most recently used, basically. OK, let's take a look at one other policy, LRU versus random. This is actually really interesting. Which one is better? So let's assume you have a four-way cache. You have cyclic references to A, B, C, D, E. They all map to the same set. If you use LRU, you get 0% hit rate. This is called set thrashing. Essentially, when the program working set within the set uh, is larger than the set associativity. So LRU is not a good policy in this case. But if you use random replacement, that's actually not bad, right? It's better when this thrashing occurs. In fact, if this is all you're doing, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, you want to say, oh, I'm going to keep a random four of these in the cache. I'm not going to do any eviction anymore. That way, you get 80% hit rate, right? So that's a much better policy than LRU. This shows you that LRU is not necessarily a good policy. It all depends on your access pattern. So in practice, it depends on the workload, of course. And it turns out the average hit rate of LRU and random are similar, because there are many of these workloads that do these set thrashing, that exhibit the set thrashing behavior. And if you want to get the best of both worlds, you really want a hybrid of LRU and random, in fact. And how do you choose between the two? I'm not going to go into detail, but you can read this paper that we have written uh, some time ago. Let's talk about the optimal replacement policy. And will be done hopefully right after that. This was introduced by Bellady a long time ago. And the idea I've already given you, actually, the idea is to replace a block that is going to be referenced furthest into the future by the program. This makes sense, right? Uh, if you know this, of course. <laughs> so how do you know this? Clearly, this requires magic. And we don't have this magic. This requires pre uh, prediction into the future, or perfect prediction into the future. Well, how do you implement this? You cannot implement this. <laughs> Is this optimal for minimizing miss rate? The answer should be yes. Is this optimal for minimizing execution time? The answer should be no. So the moral of the story over here is miss rate is a good indicator of execution time, but it's not the only thing that affects execution time, right? Remember the latencies? Miss latency, hit latency. So miss, this doesn't take into account cache miss latency or cost. And that actually varies from block to block. So if you somehow, and there are many reasons, I, I said I gave you one reason, remote versus local caches, misoverlapping, these are interesting reasons. Basically, the cost of refetching a block is not the same across the blocks. If they were the same, then this may be optimal, and there was no overlapping. But we have overlapping also, as we've discussed. OK, so if you're really interested in these concepts, I would recommend reading this paper that we've written, but this is optional. If you're really interested, take a look. Okay. Uh, have a good weekend. I'll see you tomorrow, next week.